In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The prophet Ezekiel is one of the many prophets who spoke of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, that he would be hung up on the cross and transfixed. In, in the chapter 47, Ezekiel the prophet says, I saw water flowing from the right side of the temple, and all they to whom that water came were saved, and they shall say, Alleluia. So that's a prophecy directly referring to Christ on the cross. His body is the temple. Remember he said on Palm Sunday, destroy this temple and in three days I will resurrect it. And the Pharisees only understood him as referring to the, the physical temple of stones. But St. John clarifies, and our Lord, when he was speaking, probably pointed to his own body, probably pointed to his heart. And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days it will resurrect. And indeed it did. So the water gushing from the right side of the temple is when our Lord had already died after the three hours of darkness, of eclipse, the enormous earthquake struck at three o'clock. At the very same time in the temple, the high priest of all notorious names as Caiaphas, he was about to strike the knife right through the lamb, to kill the lamb at the three o'clock hour, the traditional hour for the Passover on that Friday. And the true lamb died on the cross. And he was struck through with the lance piercing into his right side and piercing deep into his heart. And his heart and his side poured out blood and water. So the water gushing out of Christ's side is the grace that pours out through the sacraments, especially through the sacrifice of the Mass. And the blood is the... the, the the physical blood, of course, in the Mass, and also the grace poured out. And the water is physically poured out, of course, at baptism. So, to enter into the Catholic Church, we must be washed in Christ's precious blood. To enter into the mystical body of Christ, we must be washed in His precious blood. So this is why the gushing of water from His right side, as Ezekiel saw in prophecy, I saw water flowing from the right side of the temple. And all they to whom that water came, that is, all who received the Catholic faith, all those who are baptized, were saved. That is, if they kept the life of grace, which baptism gives, sanctifying grace. The, and they shall say, Alleluia. And Alleluia is the Easter hymn which is, explodes at Easter, uh, which is a foretaste of the glory of heaven, the glory given to God, Alleluia. So when the saints, St. Saint John saw in the Apocalypse, and so also did Isaiah and some other prophets that peered into heaven, the saints were often singing Alleluia, give glory to God. So that's one of the big prophecies of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And then you have other prophecies, Isaiah chapter 49. And Sion said, The Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. And then God says, Can a woman forget her infant, so as not to have pity on the son of her womb? And if she should forget, yet I will not forget thee. So yes, we have come to an age where women can forget and maltreat their babies in their womb and call it freedom and liberty and rights. This is our sick age. But even in such a sick age, I will not forget thee, Christ says. So all this is for all these prophecies pointing to the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And then, then the Canticle of Canticles, the favorite of St. Bernard and St. Thomas Aquinas, and the favorite of the Church to use when referring to the Virgin Mary, 
And often these words show the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary. Here's one quote from chapter 2, 6, and 8. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. I to my beloved and my beloved to me, who feedeth among the lilies. Put me as a seal upon thy heart, as a seal upon thy arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is hard as hell. The lamps thereof are lamps of fire and flames. Again, all referring to the burning heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, this is all fulfilled in the New Testament. In the New Testament, our Lord explicitly reveals the love of his sacred heart. Come to me, all you who thirst, and I will give you to drink. All you who come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. And we see explicitly the heart of Mary as well, referred to in the Gospels. How often St. Luke and St. Matthew say, and she kept all these words, or all these things in her heart. So Our Lady, we have the always shining in the Gospels and the, throughout the Scriptures, the burning heart of Jesus and the burning heart of Mary, the love that God has for each soul, the love He has for your soul. And that love is real in the Mass, in the Holy Eucharist. The burning heart of Jesus is here, and in the Mass, His sacrifice is reenacted. And this is what we kneel before at the Mass. This is what all the millions of angels come around for at the Mass. So, listen to also some of the words of the Fathers, <clears throat> the Fathers of the Church. And it's Pope Pius XII in his encyclical Harietis Aquas. He brings these quotes out. St. Justin who said, We adore and love the Word, born of the unbegotten and ineffable God, since He became man for our sake, so that having become a partaker of our sufferings, He might provide a remedy for them. And the remedy is, our Lord puts sugar on our sufferings, as it were, by us uniting our sufferings with Him on the cross. And they become valuable to save souls. We, shouldn't, we can never lose the sight of the value of the crosses that God gives us, the splinters and the heaviness sometimes of the cross. We can never forget the value of them when we unite them with the love of the heart of Jesus and Mary. That they do produce the glory of God and they do help to save souls from hell. And Our Lady of Fatima made this very emphatic to the children. Make sacrifices, she said. Do penance and pray because many go to hell because no one prays and makes sacrifices for them. And the best sacrifices are the ones God gives us, the splinters of every day that he gives us. St. Basil the Great, speaking of our Lord's sacred heart, he said, it is, tr it is clear that the Lord did indeed put on natural affections as a proof of his real and not imaginary incarnation, and that he rejected as unworthy of the Godhead those corrupt affections which defile the purity of our life. So yes, we see our Lord, uh, he wept tears before, at the, at the death of Lazarus. He wept tears before the city of Jerusalem, seeing their perversity, that they would reject the graces God gave. Our Lord wept tears, but he also had other uh, passions, the passion of anger, when they were defiling the temples and turning the temple into a shopping mall. And our Lord took a whip, and his anger even kept the Roman soldiers in check. They didn't dare to tackle him. They didn't dare to touch him, when normally they would. And St. Jerome says, for me, this is the proof that he's God that his anger, even the Roman soldiers, didn't t dare to deal with him. And then St. John Chrysostom, For if he, our Lord, had not shared our nature, he would not have repeatedly been seized with grief. And what causes the grief to the Sacred Heart of Jesus? It's the sins 
our sins, the sins of the human race. He quotes St. Ambrose, who says this, And therefore our Lord put on, us, on a soul and the passions of the soul. For God, precisely because he is God, could not have been disturbed, nor could he have died. St. Jerome, our Lord, to prove the truth of the manhood that he had assumed, experiences real sadness. And St. Luke really highlights this in his agony of the garden, where our Lord is so overcome that he sweats blood and that trickles down to the ground. And then the great St. Augustine, speaking of the affections and the emotions of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, he says these words, these affections of human infirmity, even as the human body itself and death, the Lord Jesus put on, not out of necessity, but freely out of compassion, so that he might transform in himself his body, which is the church, of which he deigned to be the head, that is, his members who are among the faithful and the saints, so that if any of them in the trials of this life should be saddened and afflicted, they should not therefore think that they are deprived of his grace. Nor should they consider this sorrow a sin, but a sign of human weakness, like a choir singing in harmony with the note that has been sounded, so should his body learn from its head. So just as our Lord set the tune of the passion and suffering on the cross and in his sacred passion and sufferings, so we will share in that. We will have the honor to share in that in the crosses of this life. St. John Damascene, he says, Complete God assumed me completely, and complete man is united to complete God, so that he might bring salvation to complete man, for what was not assumed could not be healed. He therefore assumed all that he might sanctify all. So, this is the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Fathers of the Church. And then, of course, Christ manifesting the burning, glowing heart of Jesus to St. Margaret Mary when he appeared to her in the late 1600s. And then our Lord, speaking to many privileged souls over the last, since that time, over the last 400 years, and to, uh, to souls, chosen souls like Sister Josefa Menendez, where he would appear to her, showing her his heart bleeding and surrounded by thorns. And he would ask her, Josepha, my spouse, will you suffer for a priest who is on the road to hell? Or some soul who's dying and on the road to hell, will you suffer for such a soul? And Josepha would, would say, yes, Lord. And then our Lord would put on her head a crown of thorns and she would endure the sufferings. Sometimes all night long, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks. And she even would go into the fires of purgatory sometimes and even to the fires of hell, Sister Josefa Menendez. She, like St. Catherine of Bologna, Mother Mariana, these, some of these chosen victim souls really suffered a lot. And St. Gemma Galgani, that, that bore the stigmata, the wounds of Christ, and Padre Pio as well. So these chosen souls, our Lord shows that the power of suffering and that Mother Mariana, for example, her suffering, which she went through, she suffered the fires of hell for five years. She would go into the flames of hell to save her superior from going there. Our Lord asked her to do that. So that's the cost of souls. And this is why the price of each soul, the price of the human race, had to take God dying on the cross. Only the blood of God in the human nature could open the gates of heaven. Let me close by quoting Dame Chotard and Father Gary Goulagrange, who give us 13 means of perfection, 13 ways we can draw much closer to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary. 
First, the desire of holiness. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, Christ tells us. And he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. So God wants us to be saints, so we should desire it. That's the biggest desire in us that there should be, is to, to love God above all things, which is holiness. Second, conformity and abandonment to the will of God and divine providence. Conforming our will to God's will and abandoning our will to, to what He wants. This is the perfection of the will. There are some souls in purgatory, some holy nuns who had to spend a few hours in purgatory, who lived holy lives, but they revealed to some other souls that they had to go through purgatory for a few hours because in their sickness and in their death, they were not perfectly conformed to God's will. So this is what we want to pray for, is just perfect conformity to God's will, which doesn't mean a passive a passivism, because our Lord wants us to fight. He wants us to work out our salvation, but always conforming our desires and our works with the will of God. Third, fidelity to grace, faithfulness to grace. Fourth, devotion to the Holy Ghost, especially asking the Holy Ghost the docility to Him to be like wax in his hands, that he can form us and not like a, a jagged stone that cuts him. Devotion to the Holy Ghost. Um, Archbishop Lefebvre would sometimes, I'm told, on, on some Thursdays, the priest, when there was no feast, the priest can say a Mass of the Holy Ghost in red vestments. And sometimes he would do that. Uh, the fifth practice, the means of perfection, is the practice of the presence of God. And it's much easier if you have the Blessed Sacrament in your chapel, or in your home, or in your monastery, or our place, our city. But even if we don't have that, we should always live in reality, which is to live always in the presence of God. St. John Bosco would always tell his boys, the angels of God are with you, and God sees you when you're alone or with others. And never forget that. Fifth is the examination of conscience. Every night, try to just review the day, see if I have offended God in a serious way or in a light way, and make an act of contrition. And if there's mortal sin, make a perfect act of contrition, desiring to go to confession as soon as one can. Sixth, confession, of course, frequent confession. Seventh, external and, and internal mortification. Not gratifying every wish, even if it seems licit. So, especially during Lent, especially on Ember Days, we, we give up food and sometimes sweets and all that as penance. But this is what the Church asks of us. But we should also foster that spirit of self-denial in ourselves, not to always give in to ourselves and our passions and our comforts. Sometimes it's good to go against that. St. Teresa, as a little quiet penance, for example, of this, of this precisely, is sometimes at the, at the meal or recreation or at table, she would not lean against the, the back of the seat. She would make herself sit up. As a, as a little penance. No one noticed, especially when you have a big habit. No one noticed, but it's a small little sacrifice that she would give to God and not give in to her self-comfort all the time. If more youth had this spirit, they would be more vigorous instead of, instead of sluggish and, and self-pitying and therefore often... Um, over, over given to melancholic thoughts. They would be more vigorous if there was more self-denial. And that's why certainly in, in the rotten public schools, the, the students who usually shine are the ones who have some discipline. The, the athletes and the, even the musicians. There's some discipline there, so they do better in their studies. It's been proven. And that's in the rotten public schools. 
So all the better in, in good Catholic schools, the, the Catholic life demands of us a self-discipline, a self-denial. The eighth means of perfection is the willingness to make sacrifices, a willingness to give, especially when it pertains to the glory of God, to deny ourselves for the glory of God. So, I don't know. You, an example, I guess, in the family would be you, you've already said a rosary. You already said a private rosary because the schedule, you knew the schedule wouldn't be a family rosary that day. But every, the schedules change. Dad says, okay, we're going to say the rosary tonight. And you, instead of saying, well, I've already said one, I'll sit on the couch. No, you, you join in the rosary, get on your knees and pray the rosary with the family. So that be willing to make sacrifices, and especially to help those in need. And that includes within the family. Ninth, the plan, give a, have a plan of life. That is, we, pertaining to our duties of state, have some plan of life. Rosary every day, you know, and some structure of, of our life around our duties of state. Tenth, spiritual reading. Nourish the soul with sacred scripture or the readings or writings of the saints. And now with internet you have access to great books and saints' writings and saints' sermons that are very available. And many people profit from this. I know one truck driver who all he does is listen to these good books and it, it, it helps him very much. So spiritual reading, at least 20 minutes with a book or with the listening. Eleventh means of perfection is spiritual direction. That is, touch base time to time with one's confessor or spiritual director. It doesn't have to be always and frequent, but once in a while to, to just touch base, to, to ask some guidance. Twelfth, form holy friendships. Have good friends that lead to virtue. Rotten apples rot other rotten apples. And this is especially dangerous with the young people. If they, get, if they choose bad friends, they will become like them. And that's why parents have to really watch not only their friends physically, but who they're talking to on internet. They should know. Parents have the right to know who they're talking to on internet. And sometimes the parents have a duty to step in and protect their daughter or son from bad contacts on internet. The parents have that right. And uh, they have the duty, in fact, to do this, to watch who they're keeping in touch with. Because some of them can be creeps that seduce them. And it's happened. The 16-year-old the daughter runs off to meet her her lover on the internet that she met, and it's not uh, some 16 or 17 or 18 year old, it's some perverted old creep who kidnaps her and, and ends up often, who knows what, and then murdering her. It's happened. It's happened. So form holy friendships. Choose friends that help towards virtue, that help towards the love of God, and stay away from bad friends. And then lastly, mental prayer, which is the one-on-one -on -one conversation with God. One-on-one -on -one conversation with the Most Holy Trinity and Our Lady, the saints, to converse with God. This is mental prayer. Try to have some time of this in the day. And I know with people who have busy jobs and it's just not possible, they can fit in some time driving. Or if, if there's a quiet lull in the workplace, you have about, during lunch hour, you have an extra 20 minutes. Well, do some meditation or prayer. Go for a little walk and speak to God. So these are the great means of perfection, summarized by the great Benedictine Dom Chotard and Father Gary Goulagrange. So let's pray to the Mother of God. Let's console the heart of Jesus. I saw water gushing out of the right side of the temple. And here in this Mass, this Sacred Heart of Jesus will be struck by the twofold words of consecration. As St. Leo the Great said, 
and out of his sacred heart will gush to your souls the fountain of mercy, of love, of grace, the inebriating sweet wine of the sacred heart. We just have to open our souls and drink. Come to me, all you who thirst, and I will refresh you. So let's ask for the grace to thirst, to thirst for the things of God. That is a grace, because most people can care less. They're filled with other toxic waters of this world. They have no thirst for God. But it's a grace to thirst for God, and we should ask that grace. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.